Hi, everybody. I'm Don Dixon, and I want to welcome you to another edition of our Q&A, Ask the Coach. And today, as you can probably already see, we look a little bit different today. Uh, I shared with you the last time we talked <laughs> that my wife made fun of me for burying my head uh, in the questions the last time we did this. And uh, all you could see was the top of my hat. <laughs> she said it looked ridiculous. So she decided that uh, we needed to fix that. And I said, the only way we can do it is to have her read the questions to me. So my wife, Allie, uh, who I introduced to you uh, last week, uh, talked about how we met and all of that. Uh, told our little love story. And I got a lot of comments. And uh, I want to mention one before we get started. David Barker, an old uh, spoon plug and friend from back in the day, sent me a question. He said, number one question for the next Q&A is, what in the world took you so long to ask her to marry you? <laughs> I said, I got an answer for that. She was in Minneapolis. I was in Central Florida. and We were both traveling all around the country doing work. And geographically, it just wasn't easy for us to get together. But over that period of time, because it was meant to be, uh, we did get together. And uh, I'm very fortunate. And I want to thank everybody for all the kind comments and all the questions of how in the world did you ever get her? <laughs> but at any rate, this is my wife. And today we're putting her to work. So let's get started. And we'll see if we can't get him answered today. Hi, so. everyone. Don's right about one thing. He is very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to okay. start with some questions from the viewers. Uh, the first one is V Mark. Can you anchor deeper than 10 feet and stick the rod in the water to make the angle of retrieve less steep when fishing the spoon plug on the cast? How about a kind of a river rig setup with a weight to help keep the lure down on the bottom? Okay, V. Mark, I'm going to get to your first part of your question, which is really a, a, a good question. And I know where you got that idea of sticking your rod down in the water. Uh, I believe the first guy to ever do that, an old friend of mine, I fished with him a couple of times, Paul Elias. Uh, he was famous for kneeling down in the front of the boat, you know, and sticking his rod halfway down in the water. And, trying to crank to try to get one of the crankbaits of the day to dive a little bit deeper. And if the truth was known, he probably got to go about this much deeper, you know. So that it that was sort of a little kind of a twist of a method that, that caught on back in the day. Now, good news is for those of us who knew Buck Perry and knew about the spoon plug, uh, we realized that we didn't have to do any and all of that. Because this lure is made out of metal and it, you can sink it to the bottom. And as you begin your retrieve, you can keep that lure on the bottom all the way back to the boat. Now we established that in order for that to happen, you must be able to anchor in 10 feet of water or less. Because as you pointed out, the angle of the retrieve is too steep at one point and it's just literally going to force the lure up off the bottom. So. There's no sense to try to figure out some convoluted way that we might be able to anchor in any depth of water and still accomplish the same thing. It's not going to happen. It's not possible. So we use what we have. And if we find a school of fish and we can't anchor 10 feet or shallower to reach and still reach them, then there is an option. As I proved to you the last time we talked about my little Lake Erie story, we go to the jump bait and fish are active. We jump it as fast as we can jump it and, and we take what we have. But I would rather be anchored and throw in a heavy jig. If I have to anchor deeper than 10 feet, I'd rather be thrown to the school of fish with a heavy jig and take my 10 or 12 or 14 fish out of that school as opposed to trying to get to the bottom with a spoon plug and having it leave the bottom, which is our number one control. Now the jig, I can keep it on the bottom. No matter how fast I jump it, creating that fast speed control, all I have to do is count it down and let it go back to the bottom. As long as it's on the bottom, I'm still in position and I fish it that way back to the boat. So it's not like your life is over if you can't find an anchor position 10 feet or shallower. However, I'll finish with this. Your biggest catches of fish, 
the numbers, the 25s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Guy called me the other day, a good friend. He said, man, I can't believe you're talking about catching fish on a cast. And he said, you forgot to tell him about that time you and I were in Sam Rayburn. <laughs> so I'll tell you that the next time. However, it's not the end of the world if you can't anchor 10 feet or less. You just go to the jump bait and, and take what you can get. But I can't even tell you the numbers of times that you are going to be able to find that 10 feet or less and anchor down on the crown of the bar and cast that spoon plug to the school of fish. And that's where you'll make your biggest catches. All right, our next question is from Jeff Gill. Would you ever cast a 700 or 800 size spoon plug? Okay, Jeff, that's a good question. And I get the meaning of your question. So I'm going to answer it uh, in real terms first. Then I'll tell you a little something else to go with it. But we never cast the 700 or the 800. Now, the intention, I'm sure, of your question was, well, maybe we could anchor a little bit deeper than 10 feet if we were using one of these bigger lures and and uh, be able to uh, still cast the spoon plug to the school of fish. Well, uh, it doesn't work that way. Again, the design of these lures with the flutes on the side and the front nose and the back tail, it's all to keep these lures running at exact depths at any speed on the troll. But on the cast, keep in mind now, they're made out of metal. So this is my 100. This is the one I use 95% of the time casting deep structure. I can sink it to the bottom. Now, if I have my anchor in position, this lure, this 100, will stay on the bottom all the way back to the boat, regardless of how fast I'm cranking it. So what kind of advantage could I have throwing a 700? it go to the bottom, stay on the bottom all the way back to the boat. I already got one that'll do that, the smaller lure. Now, why do I prefer casting with the 100 versus the 7 or the 8? Look at this 800. It's not only heavier, but it's a lot fatter. It's a lot more wind resistant. It's harder to cast. And it has a wide kind of a wobble versus a tighter wobble of the 100. We're defeating our purpose to even think about it, although I think it's a great question. People are thinking, well, maybe I could anchor 15 feet and, and keep the 800 on the bottom on the cast. You can't. The angle retrieve will pull it off the bottom. So there's no advantage. There's no uh, little secret, we can fish these bigger baits on the on the cast, the 100, the 200 and the 100, but really the 100, most every situation, this is the one you'll be using. Now, I told, uh, I said I'd tell you a little side uh, episode, uh, just because I want to show you that Buck Perry was not just a genius and a pioneer and brilliant and all of those things. He was also a pretty cool old guy. He was funny. And we used to spend so much time laughing and carrying on. It wasn't all study. It wasn't all professor, student, professor, student. It wasn't like that. He'd teach me a bunch of different ways in all kind of different situations. But one time we were in a school of white bass. There was actually some hybrid stripers too, but it was mainly white bass. And we were catching a fish. We were anchored shallow about five feet of water, and we were throwing a 250 spoon plug, the third size. And we were catching them every cast. They were there big time. So Buck says, reel in. He said, tie on a 200. We tied on a 200. I didn't know what he was doing. Throw a 200, catch a fish. As soon as we caught the first fish, he said, take that off, put on a 100. Put on a 100, cast it out, sink it, run it. Bang, we had some fish. So he said, now reel it in, put on it. Let's put on a 700. Let's see if we can catch one of them little white bass on a 700. So we put a 700 on and things started getting harder. <laughs> now, we didn't have to throw it very far. We suck it down to the bottom, we crank that lower end, knowing the school of fish is right there. It took about, as I recall, it took about seven or eight casts, and we finally caught a couple of fish on a 700. And then he said, reel head in, put on an 800. Now, we're fishing for a weight basket, <laughs> mouth about that big. Put on an 800, let's see if we can catch one on an 800, and we never did. Never caught one on an 800. We could feel a few of them, you know, hitting it and trying at it, but we couldn't catch one on an 800. 
So when you ask the question, did you ever cast a seven or eight hunter? Yeah, we did. But in real fishing, do we? No. 200 and 100. Occasionally 250s. Especially in smallmouth water and, and white bass or stripers. Uh, fish with a small mouth, if we have a chance to cast the smaller 250, we will. But in almost all fishing, to the school of fish deep structure, on the cast with a crankbait, it's going to be the 100. Okay, next question. Our next question is from K Night Shift. We have a lot of comments back and forth on YouTube, and he is one funny guy. Yeehaw! From Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky. You bet. Does a snap swivel hurt the action of a lure as compared to a snap alone? Okay, I'm going to show you a little something here to answer that question. I'll move my rod over here. We utilize a snap, but not a snap swivel. That swivel is just extra gear that you don't need that can break and pull off and pull out, so on and so forth. But we use a snap because don't forget when we're trolling and or casting, but when we're trolling, we're using different size lures. So it's easy. We have a ring on these spoon plugs and on the nose. You just snap it in. You're ready to go fishing. But let's say I check that depth and, and now I've got to change to another lure. All I have to do is unsnap and go to my, let's say I was trolling 15 feet, now I got a break line at 17 feet, I'm putting on a 700, and it's done just that quickly. So you gotta have a snap uh, when you're trolling because you're changing lures pretty much constantly on the troll. Uh, and I also use it on the cast, so we need snaps, but we never need snap swivels. Okay, next. Our next question is from Randy Compton. Please explain a little further about whether to fish the inside or outside bend of the channel. Okay, Randy, that's a good question. I'm sure somewhere when we were talking about rivers that, that I mentioned that, but let's, let's review it. Water tends to flow in a straight line. And over a period of time, when you come to an area where the river turns, the old river turns, whether it's now flooded into a reservoir or whether you're just fishing a river, uh, when you see a river change direction and it just turns, that means that water, which tends to flow in a straight line, hits something hard, something that literally forced it to turn. And this hard bottom conditions, whatever it was, it turned that river this away. What it did was start cutting structure breaks and break lines in the process and it took the water from the inside of the turn and it just sort of uh, that area of the inside turn sort of flattens out and it's kind of muddy and soft and and it just turns into nothingness it's the outside of the turn where you have all your structure breaks and break lines and where you will have your deepest water so the outside bend in the river channels, the outside bend. That This is the outside bend, by the way. Not the inside bend where it, the water flows away from it. it. Creates a soft, slopey nothing. So outside bend, don't ever forget it. Very important in our success. Okay, next. Hal Standish sent in a question. It's concerning 17 pound Manel wire. Say, when using an 800 spoon plug, the lure designed to run 20 to 25 feet down with no bow line. Would the amount of line being used be half as much with wire as with no bow? Okay, Hal, I'm not sure the purpose of your question, but let me just say, in normal fishing, in my, my standard way of operating, if I have a brake line at 22 feet, 25 feet, uh, I'm running an 800 on no bow line. Normally, I'm not running wire just so I can have it like closer to the back of the boat. I will use no bow in my regular trolling line in almost all situations unless I'm fishing for white bass, stripers, maybe some trouts, uh, and smallmouth bass, where I want to get a smaller bait down to this 20 or 20, let's say I'm fishing 22 feet. Or I could fish a short line 800 on no bow, which is normally what I would do if it was large mouth water or musky water or northern pike water. I'm beginning to run the bigger lure on no bow. 
But if I am fishing for the smallmouth species and I want to get a smaller bait down to 22 feet, I'd use a 250 spoon plug that big and go to wire. So there are times when you would do that. Now, theoretically, your question is, can I use, if it takes a long line with this 800 to get it to 25 feet, which would be somewhere between 18, 20 layers, 22 layers. Could I go to wire and just run 10 or 12 layers? Well, you could. Theoretically, you could do that. But keep in mind, there is some sort of a cutoff spot where, you know, the, you don't want it under you just directly underneath your motor. In other words, you want to have a comfortable line length. And, and don't forget, you got to reach from the surface to the bottom of the lake. So the deeper you go, these questions that you, the way you formed your question, uh, the answer is most of the time, if I can run with no bow, I don't run with wire. Most of the time, if I have a, if I have a 20 foot brake line, I'll be running a 700 on no bow unless I'm fishing for the species with the smaller mouse, in which case I would go to the wire. But do I ever try to duplicate an 800 distance with no bow by using half of the amount of wire and running the same lure? I never do that. So again, I think it depends on the meaning of your question, but I hope I answered it for you. Most of the time when I can run the no bow, I don't go to wire. I only go to wire when I have to go to wire. Or when I'm fishing the smaller species. Okay, next. We have a question from Lee Bartolini. Today, when marking the outside points or fingers on a brake line or weed line, could you just as easily enter a waypoint on your GPS sonar rather than throwing a marker? The instructions for the newest GPS units state that the waypoints are accurate to within nine feet. Well, Lee Bartolini, Sound like you're from my old neighborhood, bud. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. And I really don't know the answer to it. I used to pride myself in being able to say, there's not a fishing question you can ask me. I don't have the answer for. I put in 25 years with Buck Perry. I got the answer. But in this case, because we're talking about a newfangled technology that I don't utilize. I don't use it. So I can't really factually answer your question. However, when you said the instructions on your new GPS said that it was accurate within nine feet, that's a deal breaker for me. It really is. Buck used to always really specify to me, we have to be exact in our presentation. We have to be precise in our mapping and interpretation. We can't be sloppy. There's no room for it. You're going to miss the fish. Trust me. Take the time and be precise in your fishing, in all facets of your fishing, especially in the mechanical parts. Now, could that work? It might. Some of the guys that are using that technology today might say, Donnie, it works. It works. You know, and, and I'm saying if, if it does work, which I'm not sure of, I don't like uh, not knowing that it's not exact. If it's just sort of close, that's not good enough for me. I want to be precise. So when I fish a weed line or if I fish a, a, a bunch of one-sided bars in, in, a, in a Florida lake, out in the middle of the lake, I want to be sure when I leave there that I've hit that thing exact, that I was so precise. And if I didn't catch any fish, I know that they were not there. But if I'm using waypoints and they're close, but they're not exact, I'm not sure whether they were there or not. So to answer your question in, in the old man's terms, I'm still using markers because I can be exact. In fact, guys I used to fish with, they, they sort of kind of get a chuckle when I'd be mapping a bar and I'd throw a marker and I'd say, I say you know, that marker is not quite right. And I'd loop around, go back, pick it up, wind it up or slide it over a little bit and drop it again. And then go take another look and say, okay, now it's exact. They used to laugh at me. I sort of not laugh, but sort of smile under their breath, you know. But it's that important to me. I want to be precise. I want to know when I fish a spot that I fished it. They're, if they're there, I'm, I'm going to catch them. And if they're not there, it's okay. But I don't want to not catch them and end up being sloppy was the reason that I didn't catch them. So to answer your question, I'm not sure. But I'm in my house, 
I'm still throwing markers because I can be exact with the markers. Okay, next. Here's a question from Fishing and Fixin'. He's been one of our good friends for quite a while now. He was one of our very first YouTube subscribers. So I guess he's getting a little preferential treatment this morning. <laughs> We'll see if we can answer his question. <laughs> How do you go about getting the spoon plug downstairs using wire line? Do you let the line out, put the motor in neutral, and pump it in the same manner as the river rig? Okay. We need to answer this because, as you probably learned from me, by now, I think wire and fishing with wire and trolling deep, deep features, is really one of the most important parts of successful fishing now and in the future so let's get this right with a spoon plug we are talking about and you mentioned the river rig keep in mind a river rig i'm using a floating lure and a weight i can put the motor up in the neutral and sink her straight down nothing nothing to go wrong and once it's down i put the uh, motor in gear and start trolling and uh, to help sink the wire during that process even though it's in neutral i hold my rod low and Go ahead and do that pumping action that you talked about. That helps sink the wire. And we can't start fishing until we get hit the bottom. So, yeah, that's how we do the river rig. But with a spoon plug, you can't do that. Let me tell you why. With the spoon plug, you got two. You got a treble hook back here, and you got the belly hook. And what happens if you are up into neutral and you're not under power, and the lure isn't working? It just falls any old which way. And many times what will happen is these hooks will get caught up. They'll catch each other. And you've tumbled the lure. You've lost your trolling pass. And you won't know it until the lure hits on the bottom and you start, you go under power. And, and you feel it, it's, it's doing this. You've tumbled your lure. So you got to reel all the way in and start all over again. So when letting uh, the spoon plugs out with wire, the technique is... You keep the boat under power. You keep moving forward so that the lure's action is working. The lure is still working. It's keeping those hooks separated. So that's the idea. Uh, so we, we go as slowly as possible, but making sure we're still under power. And I can ease the rod back a little bit to help sink the wire, but I got to always be feeling the lure is working because I don't want to have it tumbled. So once I hit the bottom, I just add a little speed to the boat, and here we go. We're fishing. So no, you can't throw it up in the neutral and, and sink it because you'll pretty much you'll tumble that lure every time. So take a little extra time letting the spoon plug out on wire. It's worth it. You won't have to reel in and start all over again. Okay, next question. Uh, Michael Wagner and a bunch of other guys have asked this question. Do you know how many layers of line to let out with each spoon plug to reach prescribed depths. We're gonna to get to the bottom of that today. We fixed for that sure. for you guys. All you have to do is pay attention. <laughs> okay, Michael. Once and for all, we're gonna answer this question. I don't know, we've had we've had 50 questions about this. So my wife, my beautiful wife Allie, who you met today, she put together a chart. And she's if you go to dondixonfishing.com. And just go all the way down to to the downloads. You'll see it there. You can you can download that and have have all those answers. But I'm showing it. I'm showing you that chart here today, and I want to make a comment that we've got short line, medium line, long line, extra long line, and we talk about minimum and maximum depths of the lures. I've covered it before, but it is incredibly important that if you've got a break line at 14 feet, you know that you have a medium line 100 and you let your line out and you go to fishing. It's imperative that we've got our lure at the feature that we're trying to fish. So it's important that you know how much line to let out. Now, once you study that and get the idea, and you're always thinking of doubling those depths with wire line, that's all included in that, in that chart. But here is your final go-to test. How do you know that your lure is right at 22 feet? Answer, when you feel it bumping the bottom. That's your answer, always. Do I have enough line out? I, I don't know. You're using this as your guideline, but 
if I'm free running, if the lure is free running, and you can tell when the lure is free running, it's working, your, your rod tip's just going like that. And when it starts bumping, you can feel it. There's no doubt about it. So if you're aiming at a target 14 feet, 22 feet, 17 feet, 38 feet, 43 feet, how do I know if I have enough line out? Is my lure on the bottom? If it's not, as we used to say, dump till you bump. When your lure is bumping, you have the right amount of line out. But you have to have these guidelines to put you in the ballpark. But in the end, you might pick up a little bit, you might drop out a little bit, or if it's bumping really hard and sort of just gouging, you can hardly hold on to your rod. You got too much line, so pick up a little bit. You want it just with a nice walk on the bottom of the lake. And when you feel that, your line length is right. Hope that clears it up for you. Next question. Here's one from Gary Boggs. Do you use no bow leader when fishing with wire line? How do you keep northern pike and muskie from biting you off when you're using the spoon plug? Another good question. A lot of these questions is what I asked Buck when I started working for him. Because uh, the same questions came to my mind then. So I understand. First off, let me say that when I'm casting, and many times if I'm casting in a big, huge, natural lake, and I come to a great looking bar, I'm going to fish it deep and all of that, as you know, but I also I'm going to check the shallows. But if I'm in musky water, northern pike water, checking the shallows, let's say I have some cabbage weed in there, I'm going to throw, I could throw a suik or a big spinner bait or some of those inline baits, actually. Uh, those big old musky things that all the guys are throwing all the time. We're going to throw some of that stuff, too, just to check the shallows, check inside the, the cabbage weed before we start going deeper. Remember, I always say, fish are somewhere in the lake, shallows deep, somewhere in between. Most of the time when we run into the school of big fish, it's in the in-between water. But I've caught a lot of really big fish in the shallows, and I've caught a lot of really big fish in the sanctuary zone. So we're going to fish it all. But I can't eliminate and just automatically not fish the shallows. So if I'm fishing muskie in northern, and I'm checking inside of a bar, and I'm throwing shallow, I will always use a wire leader on the cast. When I'm fishing deep structure on the cast, if I was using a jig, I'd use a wire leader. But if I was casting a spoon plug, I would not. When I troll a spoon plug in musky and northern pike water, I do not use a wire leader. One, it sort of messes up the action of the lure a little bit, but more importantly, the way this lure works and when you're trolling it, imagine this with me down there, it's trolling. You're trolling this lure, and you know how the northern and the muskie get behind the bait and follow it and take it. They always take that bait like that. It's not like a bass can just come up sideways any which way, hit it. You don't know where the bass gets it. But the northern and the muskie, they're hitting these lures from behind. I can't ever remember in all of my years, and I've caught thousands and thousands of northerns and muskies, I can't remember one time on a troll where a muskie or a northern bit me off, trolling a spoon plug, I'm talking about. Not one time. Never happens. So the answer to your question is no. In trolling spoon plugs, we do not need a wire leader. You won't lose any. Trust me. I never have. But on the cast. I do use a wire leader when I'm casting anything other than a spoon plug. When I'm casting a spoon plug on structure, deep structure, I do not use a wire leader. Okay, next question. The next question comes from Dr. David Brown. He writes, I know everyone is thinking the same thing on this question. You showed a giant string of bass you caught trolling a lake in Florida, the lake you found with Buck, and you were trolling a six inch break line. Now the burning question is, why were all those fish caught trolling and not caught in a casting position? Okay, Doc, that's a good question. That really is a good question. I'm surprised no one else has asked me. Of course, in your question, you said maybe it's a burning question for somebody else's thinking right now too. So let's get to it. When Buck wrote his advanced material, 
one of the sections is about lake types, all the different natural lakes and all the man-made reservoirs, and we haven't really covered all of that yet, but suffice to say, there are uh, nine or ten different types of reservoirs, and you've got all the natural glacier lakes and so on and so forth, and we know what to expect as far as the structure types and all of that in each one of those situations. However, when it came to his written material, he said, when it comes to Florida, We've got to create a whole new section just for a Florida type lake. It's not like anywhere else. And it's so true, it isn't. Uh, and keeping in mind all of our basic knowledge of the fish, deep water is the home of the fish, deepest water in the area, deepest water available. And that's like this lake. The deepest water in this lake is 19 feet. It's the home of the fish, period. Uh, but it's different. Florida lakes are different. Shallow saucer type lakes. And we did a whole section when we talked about structure, about the what's available. If we find a deep water slot, we know we found our fish out here, but where do we contact those fish when they become active and move? And we talked a lot about these one-sided bars. That's all we have. That's all we can fish. We don't have traditional structure like we have everywhere else. You know, in, in, in a natural lake, bars hump saddles. In reservoirs, we have bars, humps, saddles, and a multitude of man-made structure. All very identifiable, so easy to, to locate a school of fish and anchor down and go to the cast. But in Florida, not so. We're fishing these one-sided bars. One-sided to the, to the deep water slot. Now, in most every case, these brake lines are afoot. To get a really good one in Florida is two feet. You get a two foot brake line in Florida, you got a scoop. I mean, we're, we're tickled to death. But most of the time it's a foot. And in that lake you're talking about, I'm re-showing that picture because that was some stringer fish, biggest stringer fish I've ever been involved with. And I found that lake, but it took me two days to realize where the fish were, it was a six inch brake line. Now. I'm trolling this six inch brake line, I catch fish. Now let's say the fish become active, which they did in that lake, and they move up to that brake line. Let's say you have a school of three, four hundred fish. They move up to that brake line, they can't congregate themselves at a six inch spot. Not possible. It, it, it's, it's different. So what they do is they see that brake line as a change in light. That's how they identify it. They move to it, but it's not much there. So what happens is they scatter along that brake line. You might catch a fish 20 yards up there, 50 yards up there, 50 yards down this direction, all from this same school that's scattered along that brake line. Now in many cases, these slots in Florida can run for two, three miles. And you have fish all along these deep water slots, and where we expect to run into the fish is where these one-sided bars occur where there's like a turn. You can see like it's like a finger in the brake line. It just doesn't go straight. You're going straight, falling, and all of a sudden it turns out, turns back in. Well, that turn out finger, most of the time, it's not like the end of a normal bar. It might be 50 yards, 60 yards in distance. You can't just anchor up on the flat and throw to one spot. It just doesn't make good sense. And to make the problem even more difficult, most every lake in Florida has decayed vegetation on the bottom. And decayed vegetation, by another way of saying it, it's muck. We have muck bottoms. Now occasionally there's some sandy bottoms or some harder bottoms uh, that you run into, and this is a very important what we call invisible brake lines that we fish. However, these mucky bottoms, you can't throw a traditional 100 spoon plug on the cast, you've got a casting position, but you're throwing down and sinking it down into muck. You, you, you can't get that what we normally get. But when I troll a bait, whether it's a 200, a 250, a 100 in Florida, I can regulate my line length and be so precise that I can just barely occasionally tick the bottom. And that's enough to trigger the fish. So by far, trolling is the way to go. I could show you hundreds of pictures.
of big stringers of bass we caught trolling in Florida. I can't show you two where I sat and cast and caught 25 big bass on the cast in Florida. And what dictates it is the lake type. It's the same in all kind of fishing like we just did last week up in Erie. We have to take what we have and run with it. So in this case, in Florida, all I have is all I have, one-sided bars. And by far, the most effective way is to troll those bars. <laughs> Give me a drink of that. Isn't that weird? It's so hot on the outside, but it's just icy on the inside. How do it know? How do it know? Okay. Awesome job, Donald. You're doing great. Thank you, dear. How do you like this? Is me reading you the I books? like it. I just sitting and relaxing. It's like reminds me of the days <laughs> at the summer schools at our nighttime lectures. <laughs> the guys are drinking a couple of beers, asking me questions. I'm just standing there and just having fun answering questions. It kind of reminds me of that. It's, it's right. good. I like it. We'll have to see how this looks when we're done because I'm not quite sure if this is my good side. <laughs> I'm ready for my close-up. Honey, Mr. you don't Danielle. have a bad side. Oh, now wasn't that nice? It's the truth. People thought I married him because he could catch me big fish, but... I think I had something to do with it. I married it. him because of that. He's very sweet. She actually looked at all the study material and thought, well, I could spend the next two, three years getting really smart about all this, or I could just marry the old guy and let him drive the boat. <laughs> Guess what happened? <laughs> That's how it happened. Oh, that's it. Okay. okay. Here's our last question for today. This one's from Jeremy Schwartzfelder. Jeremy Schwartzfelder. 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 I know, but if you're from Germany, it's probably Schwartzfelder. I think he's from Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Okay, okay. Jeremy. <laughs> Our last question comes... Forgive us on his, your last name, but here, we're going to answer your question, though, for sure. Okay. Okay, now this is a three-part question. The first one is, once I have located the deepest water in an area of my lake, am I only looking and ultimately then fishing one of the 17 structure types that connects to the deepest water and goes all the way? Yes. A structure must lead all the way. Buck talks about it over and over and over and over and over. For a structure to produce fish, it must lead all the way from the shallows to the deep water. That doesn't change no matter where you're fishing. That's just the absolute. That's one of those absolutes. Got to lead all the way. Next question. Okay, here's the second part of that question. When you say a structure must lead all the way, do you mean all the way to the shore or all the way to 8 to 10 feet of water or less? That's an easy one. 8 to 10 feet or less is the answer, my friend. Because don't forget, 8 to 10 feet is what Buck refers to as the shallows. And in his overall statement, he says, for a structure to produce must lead from the shallows all the way to the deep. So the answer is 8 to 10 feet. If you want to know how to verify that, find you a hump out in the middle of the lake, surrounded by deep water, but it comes up to 6 feet on top. The fish all over that thing, because <coughs> it leads all the way. Okay, and here's the third part of Jeremy's question. Jeremy, you're getting a lot of, you're getting a big bang for your buck here, I guess, right? Um, did you subscribe three times just for that? All right, here we go. Yeah, you get say, your mom and your dad to subscribe. Dang it! We'll be even. Subscribe. <laughs> here we go. You say that in some cases, in order to have success when fishing certain types of reservoirs. <sighs> okay. You say that in some cases, in order to have success when fishing. Having heat stroke. You say that in some cases, in order to have success when fishing certain types of reservoirs, you move up the lake towards towards the towards headwaters. The How far do you go? Good question. The answer is I only go as far as I have to. Now, part of your question said you you can actually have five feet of water in the channel, you know, breaking off at two feet. Well, we're not going up there. We want to have deep water. We want to have good deep water because the translation of that is we will also have deep readable structure that we can fish. I don't want to go any further than I have to. My purpose for moving upstream, up the reservoir, is to find better water color, not be fishing down near the dam where you have steep structure, not readable structure, not very fishable structure, and very clear water. But the further up I go, things start flattening out a little bit. Flat's a bad word. 
start getting a little more like of this where I can have readable, fishable structure and better watercolor. But I never want to go too far. I don't want to go up where the channel is only 22 feet deep and everything that's breaking into the channel is 10 feet. How often am I going to get a good movement of fish to 10 feet? That's no good. So I only go as far as I have to to find that better watercolor but still have good depth. Remember the musky tournament? We still had 70 feet in the channel and good stuff breaking at 35 and 45 feet, but I had better watercolor. So go up the reservoir, but don't go too far. Go only as far as you have to to get a little better watercolor. Okay. Thanks for joining us today for our Q&A session, and it was great having my wife uh, helping me out and doing some of the hard work here. <laughs> keeping my nose out of the book and uh, I hope y'all learned something and and she said she hoped that I would not talk too much longer because she's starting to sweat it's hot <laughs> it's only about 96 it's degrees it's hard to look here. pretty when it's 108 come on man so we're going to close it off today and I want to really let you know how much I appreciate you being with us and I hope you learned a little something today so be sure to uh, follow us on, what is that? Follow Inst us on Instagram. Instagram. Like us on Facebook. And, and whatever you do, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We need yeah. we need 1,000 subscribers, and we need them like last week. So if you want Don to keep doing this, hit the button. Ring the bell. Just, if you just <laughs> send me on off to the retirement home, don't subscribe. Either way, it's okay. <laughs> anyway, we appreciate having you here, and we'll see you the next time.